the main topic of today's lecture is going to be economic models. And the reason I'm going to take some time to focus on this is because I want you all to understand the economic method. Uh, this is much like taking a science class. You know, if you take um, a chemistry class, for example, one of the elements of a chemistry class is you're going to sit down and you're going to do experiments during labs. And those experiments are meant to instruct you about the scientific method, how experiments are used in order to generate knowledge and information in the realm of chemistry or biology or whatnot. Well, in the same way, it's important, I think, for you to understand how economic models are constructed or how economic thinking is, like what methods are economists using to try to understand the world around us. And for the most part, economics falls into the category of using deductive reasoning to try to create simplified real-world economic relationships. Models are simplifications, as mentioned here in this, in this slide. And a deductive exercise is, is we're going to walk our way through kind of what that deduction means. I will point to, I don't have a slide on this, but another method of scientific inquiry is to use what's called induction rather than deduction. And induction starts with the data or the empirical observations about the world around us and brings that to try to make some sense of it, tries to make understanding of what's actually happening in the real world. In actuality, economics is about, does a little bit of both of these things. We look at the world and try to see what's happening. But then we bring some of that information to a model, to a simplified version of that system, which we then write down with mathematical relationships or we create a graph over it. And we use that to try to understand in a much simpler setting how things might work. And we're hopeful that if we can put together a simple version of the economy and understand how that works, that that can then be used to identify conditions needed for certain outcomes to arise. We can better understand what could or may or may not happen in the real world by studying the simplified versions of the world, which we call a model. And, and just like a model of an airplane is a simplified, smaller scale version of a real airplane, we can still use that model to help us understand aspects of a real airplane, for example. Talk a little bit about what deductive reasoning is. So deduction is really setting up a model that follows the following logical format. I'm going to say if X, where X represents a whole set of assumptions, this is true and if this is true and so forth. If these sets of assumptions are true, then we're going to logically infer, make inferences or deductions, deduce that a certain set of conclusions or implications will follow. All right. And every economic model can be set up in that particular form. So when I present to you an economic model, and we're going to present a series of them through this course, I'm going to begin by saying, let's assume this is true, and let's assume that's true, and let's assume we're going to make a bunch of assumptions. That exercise is setting up a simplified version of the world that's going to conform to these particular sets of assumptions. Then we're going to use our reasoning, our thinking capacity, to infer what happens as a result of those sets of assumptions, what sorts of conclusions may come about. So an example of this kind of syllogism is if bugs have four legs, and if Duke is a dog, then Duke has four legs. And that's a very simple expression of a kind of deductive exercise that we're taking, that we're going to be doing in, in economics. Now, I want you to be aware now, or at an early stage, that even when we get later on and we're talking about supply and demand curves and how they shift around and, and what implications policy changes might have, we are working within a deductive exercise that can be formulated just like this. We've got a set of assumptions built into those models and those assumptions are going to generate certain implications or conclusions. Now, I want to highlight a logical fallacy that sometimes happens because one of the things that's going to happen in economics is you're going to probably disagree with some of the assumptions, or you're going to think that the assumptions are not really valid in the real world. And what some people have a tendency to do is to dismiss a higher logical exercise because the assumptions are not true. And it happens sometimes they assume or imagine that if an assumption is not true, that the conclusions are therefore also not true. And that's not quite correct. It's a logical fallacy to say that. And I just want to emphasize that in a moment here. So for example, if all dogs do not have four legs, so the four legs assumption is false, 
and Duke is a dog, we're making that assumption again. Well, it doesn't follow that Duke does not have four legs. He might, but he might not. It's just that we can't know for once we've dropped that particular assumption about the number of legs a dog might have, right? And it's kind of similar in economic models. Just because some of the assumptions in our models are invalid in the real world, doesn't mean that the conclusions won't happen. It just means we can't be sure that the conclusions are gonna happen. That sense of doubt that we will have, but be careful about how far we go with it. All right, I wanna highlight, and I'm gonna give you a couple of dichotomies here, three of them in particular, that I want you to think about with respect to models. And we're gonna come back and think about this with respect to all of the economic models that we um, are gonna present. And part of the reason for this exercise is to constantly remind you that models are this kind of deductive exercise. So first, assumptions versus implications. Um, so anything that's in the if part of the statement of an economic model are what we're gonna characterize or call the assumptions of the model. And generally speaking, there's gonna be lots of different assumptions. We're gonna say, if this is true, that's true, this, 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 we're gonna add sorts of things together. And then we will deduce from those particular assumptions certain outcomes, conclusions, implications is the word I'll use here, okay? And there's likely to be many fewer implications in the model. So we're likely in each model to come up with a couple of key results, things we will learn from the deductive exercise that we're doing. And I want you all to begin to learn how to recognize what's an assumption and what's an implication. A lot of times it's really easy to do. Sometimes it's a little bit trickier, as you will see as we go along. Now, there are different types of assumptions, and I want you also to be reflecting on this particular aspect of it. Economists build models, not haphazardly. Uh, we don't just throw in a bunch of assumptions with no reason whatsoever. We have two different ways. I'm going to classify the assumptions in two different ways. First of all, the key assumptions, if you will, are going to be the ones that reflect reality. We're going to basically be using an inductive exercise. We're going to observe the world and note, hey, these seem to be some regularities of the real world. Here's how people behave. Here's some things that seem to be true. Let's incorporate these aspects into our model. Let's make them assumptions, assume they are true, and then we'll see what the implications of that will be. Okay, so a lot of the assumptions that economists include in a model are gonna be there because they reflect the reality of the world. Okay, but if we tried to include all of reality in the model, if we tried to make the model as realistic as possible, what economists and scientists have learned is that usually the exercise is just too complicated to make any sense of. If you include reality in all of its um, aspects, the world is too complex to make any sense of. So the second nature of the assumption you make are what can be called simplifying assumptions. We think maybe they don't matter too much to the outcome, although they might, but we're going to include them often as a first pass to make sure that we make the model tractable. And tractable means make it easier to comprehend and to solve, to really understand what the implications of this set of assumptions are likely to be. If we include too many aspects of the world, it just makes models intractable. We can't tell what the results would be in a really complex world. And that's the nature of modeling. What we're trying to do is simplify the world so that we can get a handle on it and really make some sense of it. All right, now I'm gonna talk about another type of assumption, which is consequential versus inconsequential. The consequential assumptions are the ones that matter. They directly impact or affect the outcome of the model. So if you relax, and by relax, I mean change it or eliminate an assumption, a consequential assumption, an implication is no longer guaranteed. Uh, drop a consequential assumption, we lose the outcome. It might happen, but it may not happen. And often, assumptions that reflect reality are indeed consequential. But if you relax or, or change an inconsequential assumption, then the implications are not likely to be affected. And, and I'm going to give you some examples of this in just a minute by looking at a simpler version of a model that you are all very familiar with, and that's MAPS. All right, so many assumptions that are simplifying are inconsequential, but not all of them. Some, lots of times, simplifying assumptions make a big difference to the outcome. All right, so how do we make sense of all of this? I'm going to do it by presenting a model which you should all be familiar with, and that is a simple map. So I'm going to use a map as an analogy and argue that maps can be thought of as a deductive exercise. Now, most of you will not think of a map that way. 
Namely, you don't think of a map as saying a map is telling us if X, Y, and Z are true, then A, B, and C follow. It doesn't seem to be of that particular nature. I'm going to try to suggest to you that a map is exactly that. The map is a simplification of the world around us. And as such, we make a bunch of assumptions that we take sometimes for granted. And then we use that map to fulfill a particular purpose. And the purpose of the map tends to be the implications of that model. Okay, this is a map I grabbed from the internet some years ago, and it's a hand-drawn map. After looking at it and analyzing it sometime, I actually happened to know that this is a map of Bloomington, Indiana. And it was undoubtedly drawn by some individual who no doubt lives in this house over here and is directing their guests, no doubt, how to get out of Indianap uh, how to get out of Bloomington, Indiana, and get to Indianapolis. Walnut to Indy, this means Indianapolis is in that particular direction. All right, so what I want to do is I want to take this simple map and want to present it and think about it in terms of a model. Why this is a model and why what implications this particular model happens to have. All right, so let's go ahead and do that. First of all, talk about assumptions and implications. And Here's how we're going to set up and talk about the assumptions of the model. The assumptions are kind of all the things we take for granted in this particular map, like lines are streets. Okay, so go back to the map in front of you here. And we know by looking at this particular map that dark straight lines corresponds to streets. And we also have next to each of these streets, we often have a name like Third Street, Fourth Street, Kirkwood Street, and so forth and so on, right? So these street names, we're making assumptions that the straight lines correspond to streets. We're making assumptions that the names of these next to these correspond to the names that you're going to see on actual streets in the real world. We're making assumptions about, we've got these little circles. Actually, that one is almost not a circle. It's a hexagon, but it looks like a circle almost. And these circles or hexagons correspond, no doubt, to stop signs. Now, a lot of times, a map is not going to be self-explanatory. And so what might happen in a map is the creators of the map might put together, right, a legend. And a legend is just a correspondence. It's like, take the lines to represent roads. Take the circles to represent stop signs. Take the names that are written on the map to correspond to the names of the street. So the legend is going to have to give instructions of the map. It's telling you what assumptions are being made. Okay, we've got some other things that are on this map too, though. We've got little squares that are drawn off of the lines. And those squares or shapes, you know, this is a stop sign, but this is a building because it's listed as Bloomington Bagel Company, for example. So we know that that's some building that happens to be next to a road. Don't know what road because no name is given right here, right? So we're not going to be sure. We're given that there's a Jimmy John's as this little thing. Looks like a stop sign maybe, but it's not. This is a different indication and a different structure that we're representing. Now, there's some other information on the map. And the other information that's important are these arrows. The arrows are telling the individual that's going to be using this map a direction of travel. It's basically telling you travel in the direction of the arrows and you're going to make your way out of town. So go this way and then this way and then this way and then this way. And if you do all of that, you're going to make your way out of town. So now let's go back to my next slide. Assumptions. What are the assumptions we're making in a hand-drawn model? We're saying if the lines are streets, if the street names are accurate reflections of the names in the real world, if the arrows are the direction of travel, if the breakfast locations, because the other purpose of this map is to give the individual some information about where they might stop for breakfast on their way out of town. If the O's at the intersections are stop signs, onward and onward, et cetera, et cetera, then what are the implications of the map? The implications are if you travel along the arrowed roads, it will lead you out of town back to Indianapolis. And secondly, if you want breakfast, you can stop at the recommended shops along the way. So it's giving you some recommendations. But if you care to, stop at those places on your way out. All right, so that's how a map conforms to a deductive kind of exercise. It's got a set of assumptions. It's got a set of implications. Now, let's look at the assumption types. Some of the assumptions are made because they reflect reality. Street names, for example, are accurate reflections of the actual street names. If I go back to this map and I say, well, let's not make this second street. Let's just call it um, XYZ Street. 
you know, if we call this XYZ street and if we call this W street, in other words, we make the street names not reflective of what's actually happening in the world, the user of this map is going to have them. Getting to the implications and getting out of town may turn out to be difficult to do. So the street names are accurate. Those are reflecting reality. The arrows are the appropriate direction of travel, how you should drive your car to get out of town. The breakfast locations are approximately in the right places. You're going to be able to find the breakfast locations if you look for them in the places on the map and so forth. A bunch of the assumptions are simplifying, though. Okay, so let's think about the fact that straight lines are streets. Most of us should have no problem recognizing that there is a correspondence being made there. A straight line on a diagram, on a piece of paper, doesn't really look like an actual street. Look outside your window, you see a street, it's a big broad asphalt, cars on both sides, it looks very different from just a straight line, right? Well, why don't we make the street more accurate? Why didn't the drawer of the hand-drawn map make the street wide so that you have some room for the car? Why didn't it put parked cars along the side? Why, why didn't it include more of that reality? The answer to that is, because we don't really need all of that extra stuff. We don't need, we just need to know that the straight lines correspond to an actual street and most of our just fine with that particular simplifying assumption. We're making the streets simpler because they're easier to draw and we don't need that detail in order to make sense of the map. Okay, the zeros at intersections. You know, our hand-drawn map kind of made an attempt to make these hexagons, not to make them circles, but if they made them circles, you might be fine with that. Simplify it, just draw some little circular line and it's going to be a reasonable approximation of what a stop sign looks like. If you know, if you wanted to draw a traffic light, you might do something like this, right? You might do this and say, there's a traffic light at a particular place and that would distinguish it from the stop signs. But you don't put the red and the green and the yellow, you simplify the representation because those details turn out not to matter very much. It's not gonna be very important. Some other simplifying assumption. There's a lot of things missing from this particular map. And if you read the notes for this particular class, I walk you through a series of increasingly realistic maps that are presented on Google, Street View, and so forth. And as you get more and more accuracy, it gets closer and closer to looking like the real world. But real world map of Bloomington, Indiana, there are a lot more streets than are actually listed on this hand-drawn map. So many of the streets and names of the streets are missing. That's done because, look, that hand-drawn map drawer just doesn't have the time to draw a perfectly accurate map, nor is it really necessary to do so. So what the map drawer has done is to simplify the presentation by just keep eliminating the streets and the names of streets that are unimportant. It doesn't get rid of all the unimportant ones. So you'll notice, you know, you come up Second Street here, and you turn right on Henderson, and Indi uh, that'll turn into Indiana. That's what that means, actually, although I wouldn't know unless I had looked at an actual map of Bloomington. Uh, but you come up, you turn right on Henderson Street, you're going to pass 3rd Street and keep going. So it's giving you some extra streets that you may or may not need. And then it's saying go all the way until you get to Kirkwood and then turn left. Well, how many streets are there between here? We don't really know. So there's lots of missing information from this particular map. And that's missing to simplify the exposition, to make it simpler to comprehend and to see just what you need in order to use this map for its purpose. A couple of other things. Uh, the scale is inaccurate. Bloomington, Indiana is not on the size of a piece of paper. It's much bigger than that. Most of us should be fine using a map and recognizing that when we get on the street from the house on 2nd Street and drive down to Henderson and turn right, that might be a block. It might be a couple of blocks. Um, it's going to be some distance that's not corresponding to the distance on this piece of paper, of course. Why do we do that? To simplify the analysis and make it easier easier to put onto a piece of paper. Buildings are simple shapes and so forth and so on. So again, some of the assumptions reflect reality. Some of the assumptions made just to keep the map simple enough so that you can draw it and present it to your friend for their directions out of town. The last dichotomy, consequential versus inconsequential. Now, the starting location is accurate, is a consequential. If you're going to use this to get out of town, you've got to know where you're starting from and you've got to be able to follow the arrows. The stop sign locations are probably consequential. If they're in the wrong places, you might get confused. If you come to Kirkwood, for example, up here, you're supposed to turn left and there's no stop sign there. Well, you're going to be confused and say, am I at the right? Maybe there's another Kirkwood I'm supposed to. I'm supposed to be looking for the stop sign, 
but I don't see the stop sign there. So a lot of what's on this map that's there to reflect reality actually has consequential effects in terms of getting you effectively out of town. There has to be a matching between the real world and the instructions on this map in order for it to be used effectively or appropriately. Street names are accurate. If you turn right from 2nd Street and you don't come across a 3rd Street ever, if it's never there, well, you're going to start doubting whether you're heading in the right direction. You might turn off and try something else because the map doesn't seem to be working for you, right? So these assumptions that you're including are not haphazard. They're critical in order to help the user of this map get out of town effectively. And so they're consequential. The arrows are the correct direction of travel listed here. Uh, the breakfast locations have to be pretty accurate so that you can find them. All of these matter in terms of fulfilling the purpose of the map. Okay, but what are inconsequential ones? Lines are streets. So using a simplification of the streets and saying, let's just make it a line instead of a true reflection or a true picture of what a real street looks like. Should that affect the ability of this person to get out of town? Rationally, logically, I think, no, shouldn't have any effect upon that at all. Everyone should be able to make that transposition between a line and a street being the same thing, and it should not matter in terms of you using the map effectively. So the fact that the lines are not true reflections of real streets, it's fine. It's inconsequential to the result. The fact that the intersections don't have a true hexagon, but have a zero instead, maybe they have to tell you like a legend and say, oh, those zeros, those are stop signs. Um, the user of the map might ask that question. But as long as you know they're stop signs, it's inconsequential that they're O's and not hexagons, for example. It's inconsequential that the scale is not completely accurate. You don't need to have the scale perfect. Distances from one street to the next don't have to be accurate for you to appropriately and to effectively use the map to get your way out of town. All right, so you can see, I hope, in my discussion of this, how you can kind of logically infer, deduce, whether these assumptions are critical assumptions, consequential, or whether they're not very critical, inconsequential to the nature of the outcome or the use of the map. And this is the kind of exercise we're asking you to do with all of our economic models. So you can expect to see, and you will see this in problem set number one and in quiz number one, no doubt, me asking you about economic models and asking you, for example, what are the assumptions of the model? What are the implications of the model? What, do these assumptions reflect reality or are they simplifying and so forth? And you need to just kind of think through whether the, what the nature of these assumptions are in order to answer these individual questions. And I'll, I'll give you markers and sign. I'll give you explanations of this as we go along as well. Okay, do all of you see a topographic map? All right, now this is a different kind of map and it has different assumptions built into it. So I'm not going to go through this in the detail that I did on the hand-drawn map, but I want you to recognize or see this map for the following reason. Just like there are different types of maps to represent different types of geographic information, there are different types of economic models to represent different economic phenomena, all right? So one thing I want to dispel from your minds in case it's there is I am not going to be presenting you like the economic model, like the model that explains everything in the economy, because there isn't one. There are many different models that analyze different aspects of the economy, just like there are many different types of maps that correspond to, that represent different types of information geographically and can be used for different purposes. Now, this particular topo map, just a couple of differences from the previous map I want to highlight. So one thing to note is that straight lines, straight black lines, no longer represent roads. If I look here and notice, well, where are the roads? You can see like there is a, so you should see, here's the road that goes through this particular village. I think it's in Stovermont, right? So the road is corresponding to, it's a thick line now, and it's got red and white dashes that represent the road, right? So that's a different assumption. It said now not straight black lines represent roads, but now this red, white dashed line represents the road. Or this here, now this is a non-dashed line, which is a different level or different size of a road that's represented, for example. All right, so we're making a different assumption about what roads are. You can look at this map and notice that you've got all these brown lines on the road. And we know if you're familiar with topographic maps, that these represent the elevation levels in a particular geographic area. And so each line represents a different elevation level. We can also notice that we've got little black specks here, little squares or rectangles. These correspond to buildings or structures that are located in these particular locations. And to be a good map, 
these all have to be accurately located. You need to know if you're using this map where the individual buildings are, where those are. The green represents the forested areas, the non-green represents non-forested areas, and so forth and so on. So these are different assumptions that are being made that are a little bit different than the assumptions that were made on the hand-drawn map. And we'll do that in economics too. You know, sometimes we'll talk about P being the price of a good. Sometimes we'll talk about P being something else in the model. We will change the assumptions along the way sometimes and start afresh with different assumptions in different economic models. And so that's how we're going to proceed and how economic analysis is going to work. Map. I've got assumptions and implications. I just walked our way through the assumptions. Uh, the implications are, you know, I'm not sure what you would use a topo map for, but you might use it when hiking, certainly. You might be able to then tell what your elevations will be. Topographic maps are big for war planning or for troop movements during war and things like that, and they were developed largely for those purposes, perhaps. Uh, and so the implications are a little bit more difficult to conceive of in this particular ma map because I'm, I'm not sure exactly what the topo map might be used for. But we can see the information that's presented and we can see the assumptions and so forth. Notice, too, the topo map's a little bit more realistic than the hand-drawn map. It's got all of the detail or much more detail of a particular area that's included there. But different maps will vary in different ways. So here's another map, just very quickly, and I'm not going to walk through this, but one distinction of this map from the others we've looked at is the straight black lines, like here in the middle, those are no longer roads, right? We know from looking at this map that those straight black lines correspond to geographical boundaries between the states. Okay, so different map, different assumption about what the black lines represent. Similarly in economic models. All right, so these are the ways or distinctions, methods we're going to use in trying to understand the economy. The only way to really make sense of that, though, is to start analyzing economic models and thinking about them in this particular way. All right, so... I think these are the points I just made. We use different maps or models for different purposes. Assumptions may be the same from model to model to model. And that's going to be true in economics a lot. So I use the term P to represent the price. In most economic models, P is going to represent the price. You know, we pick a representation that's easy to remember. So instead of calling the price alpha, for example, Greek letter, we'll use P because it matches the English name for that particular item, and it's easier to remember in that particular way, all right? We might ask ourselves, well, what's the best map to be used? What's the best one? And our answer should be, well, there is no best map. It depends on the purpose for which the map is drawn. It depends on how you want to use it. There are different levels of details of a map that might be appropriate for different purposes. Same way for an economics model. Different types of economic models that are directed or constructed to look at different aspects of the world around us, different aspects of the economy. All right, so lots of different models can be presented, and we're going to hope that each of these models gives us a little bit of insight as to how the real world actually works, just like a map gives us some information and insight about how the geographic location looks and what we might do with that information.